I'm Elisa Parenti in New York, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. Civil rights leader and former presidential candidate Jesse Jackson has announced he has Parkinson's disease. In a statement, the 76-year-old Jackson said he will make lifestyle changes in hopes of slowing the disease's progression. Jackson's father also suffered with Parkinson's. The CEO of Puerto Rico's public power company has resigned. Ricardo Ramos was under fire for the island's effort to rebuild the electric grid following Hurricane Maria. In particular, the decision to award a $300 million contract to a tiny Montana company that raised eyebrows and red flags. That contract has since been canceled. After escaping house arrest in his native Venezuela, former Caracas mayor Antonio Ledesma has fled to Europe by way of Colombia. The high-profile opposition leader was accused of plotting to remove Venezuelan president Nicolas Maduro. In a phone interview, Ledesma told the Associated Press, quote, I am more useful fighting for Venezuela's democracy abroad than I am as a hostage in my home. And Pfizer is demanding the state of Nebraska not use any of its drugs to carry out the death penalty. The state planning to execute a death row inmate with a cocktail of four drugs, three of which Pfizer makes. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti, and this is Bloomberg. I'm Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Stitch Fix goes public. We discuss what sets the online styling service apart from the competition with early investor Bill Gurley of Benchmark. Plus, Elon Musk revealed Tesla's semi-truck to much fanfare. So will it upend the transportation industry? We'll hear from Gene Munster of Loop Ventures. And one of Apple's most anticipated new devices won't be available for the holiday shopping season. Why customers will have to wait until next year to get the HomePod. But first, to our lead. A new tech IPO hits the public markets. Shares of Stitch Fix, the online personal styling service, popped at the open but then cooled off on its first day of trading. The company raised less than it was aiming for but got to market with just a fraction of the cash of most venture-backed companies, raising just $42 million. One high-profile backer, Benchmark Capital's Bill Gurley, is still bullish. I spoke with him earlier today and asked what he sees that other investors don't. Early in my career, Emily, I had the opportunity to get very close to the management team at Dell, uh, the computer company, um, when I worked on Wall Street as a sell side analyst. And one of the things that led to just a spectacular run by Dell, 100x in the public markets, um, was that they figured out that if you um, personalize, if you build each unit to individual order, you can not only serve the customer better, but you can actually have a more efficient supply chain as well. And from the very minute that I met Katrina, I had alarm bells going off in my brain that what she was doing had, you know, very similar analogies to what Dell did back then. So, you know, you were the lead analyst on Amazon's IPO, for example, and anyone in the e-commerce market is incredibly fearful of this giant in the room. When it comes to Amazon, do you worry about the threat when it comes uh, to a company like Stitch Fix? I, first of all, everyone should be paying attention to Amazon and everyone should be aware of them and treat them with the utmost respect. They're probably one of the best executing companies in the world. I think Mr. Buffett may have just said that. Um, that said, in this case, I think Stitch Fix is competing a lot more with the Nordstrom's of the world, the Macy's of the world, the HMM's, the ASOS's of the world that are the leaders in providing fashion and apparel to to the, to, to the consumer base. Right now, we take a very different approach. Amazon's known for having Earth's largest selection, and if you go on there, you can search through SKU after SKU after SKU. We come at it from a remarkably different place. We try and learn as much as we can about the individual, and then we use machine learning and collaborative filtering, a whole bunch of algorithms that helps of our stylists, and we deliver something to you that you haven't even seen yet. Our head of algorithm says it's the ultimate recommendation engine because we don't even let you look at the choices. And that level of curation is something that's highly unique, I think, both against the general apparel community and even against Amazon. 
So, you know, Stitch Fix, you know, unlike some of these other on-demand clothing subscription companies, has actually fared well. Others have gone out of business. What makes you think Stitch Fix will be immune to that and have some sort of greater potential? Sure. Well, first of all, there's already the size and scale that, that the company's already accomplished. So we're at a billion dollar run rate. We've been profitable for many quarters. Uh, in fact, when the company came public, there's over a hundred million dollars of cash on the balance sheet. The company had only raised $40 million. Hence, we had created $60 million in free cash flow, uh, something that's extremely rare in Silicon Valley these days. Um, and so unit economics are proven. Um, the business model's proven. Uh, the company has a very mature management team. So that's just, I think there's already proof that can answer that question. The second thing I would say, though, is if you look at the characteristics of the company in terms of how much we understand about our customer and how much we understand about our product and inventory, I think we're light years ahead of our competitors. So you can put us up against anyone, Nordstrom's, Macy's, any of these players, and I am certain that we know 10x more about our customers and even 10x more about the merchandise. That was Bill Gurley, general partner at Benchmark Capital. I also talked to him about Uber and the bigger tech landscape. We will bring you that conversation later in the show. But first, I do want to dig into Stitch Fix's road to IPO. With us now, our Bloomberg News IPO reporter, Alex Barinka in Boston. So, Alex, walk us through what happened, the fact that they raised less than they hoped for. They sold fewer shares than they hoped for. And yet, you know, Bill Gurley, at least, has a lot of optimism about this company. That's right. They ended up selling 8 million shares at 15 bucks a piece. They had initially planned on selling 10 million, with 1 million of those coming from CEO Katrina Lake uh, for a range of 18 to 20 dollars a share. I spoke to uh, the CEO Katrina earlier today, and she said uh, they had a little bit of uh, difficulty explaining the story. She said the story of Stitch Fix is not obvious. It's not easy to tell. She said it seemed like investors it, throughout the course of the road show couldn't quite place them because uh, they're not not an e-commerce company and they're not a, uh, a, a traditional retailer. She did seem optimistic and said they're looking forward to continuing to prove that they have uh, consistent growth and they have prudent growth. She said they're not about growth at all costs. So, you know, when I break down the valuation, today the stock closed at a market value of about $1.5 billion. That gives it a price to sales value right in line with your typical retailer at 1.5 times uh, 12 month trailing sales. When I look at e-commerce, that's closer to 4.4 times. So it does seem like the investment community looked at Stitch Fix and didn't necessarily give them the premium that they think that the uh, those data algorithms that Bill Gurley was talking about uh, adds value to their product. Now, what I mentioned earlier is incredible about this company that they only raised $42 million in, 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 in terms of getting to market, I believe, Bill Gurley made the C Series B investment in Stitch Fix uh, a few years ago, and they haven't had to raise money again. That said, Katrina Lake told you that investors are asking, is this business scalable? Is this business sustainable? How is she answering those questions? So investors, she said she was actually surprised. Investors were asking about the scalability of uh, the human stylist. Because remember, Stitch Fix uses the data, but there are also people behind the scenes that help consumers pick their clothing choices. She didn't seem uh, worried about finding more people who can help curate those outfits. And in terms of the, uh, the profitability aspect, they have turned a profit in the past. And frankly, I was a little bit surprised that uh, the investor community didn't give them more credit for being cash flow positive. And, and being able to fund themselves. So she says she's going to continue growing at a similar clip uh, is what they're expecting. She wouldn't give specific uh, guidance in terms of, of forward revenue growth, but she does say uh, prudent growth and you know growing at, in a, at a pace where they can still have a nice cushy bottom line is the key. And she also said they're looking into uh, the men's category, the plus size category, and those premium offerings are kind of the areas where she expects the most growth on top of continuing to build out the uh, the women's offerings that were kind of the the first thing that Stitch Fix rolled out. Alex, how does Stitch Fix st fit into the story of the other tech IPOs we've seen so far this year? It's been a bit of a choppy story. Snap uh, going public to much fanfare, but struggling since Blue Apron as well. Uh, and then a few select companies doing well, but in fits and starts. 
Yeah, and it seems like anyone that touches consumer tech or has a consumer uh, idea to it, they've gone out with a lot of buzzy fanfare. The two you mentioned are perfect examples. Snap uh, was up 44% on day one. We've seen that stock fall way off. Blue Apron was unchanged. Um, that consumer idea uh, has had a bit more of a challenge when it comes to the IPO markets. On the flip side, you look at companies like SailPoint, which raised $240 million and listed today an enterprise tech company. If you're enterprise tech, and you're showing strong recurring revenue and a path to profitability, those stocks are actually performing a lot better. So in the broader sense of tech IPOs, consumer tech companies probably are thinking about how they pitch their story effectively to investors, or at least more effectively than some of these names that we've seen go out in 2017. All right, Alex Barinka, our Bloomberg IPO reporter in Boston. Alex, thanks so much. Well, in deal news, the U.S. Justice Department is delaying a filing, delaying filing a lawsuit against the proposed Time Warner AT&T deal, apparently because no states want to join the action. MLEX says the DOJ sent out summaries to about 18 states and none would join. The lawsuit was expected to be filed this week. AT&T is planning to fight to acquire Time Warner in a deal valued at $85 billion. Coming up, Tesla made some big announcements Thursday night, unveiling a new semi-truck and reviving the Roadster. Will these new additions to Tesla's portfolio add to Elon Musk's production hell? We'll discuss next. This is Bloomberg. Tesla has launched a fully electric semi that boasts incredible speed and range. The company hopes its latest vehicle will change the road as we know it. And CEO Elon Musk surprised customers by also rolling out a new Roadster, its fastest model ever. Bloomberg's Tom Randall was at the launch in L.A. Take a listen. Tesla just unveiled its first electric semi-truck. CEO Elon Musk had promised a beast, and he delivered. It offers the longest range and fastest charging time of any electric vehicle ever made. Uh, now, one of the biggest questions we've been asked about electric trucks is, well, how far can they go? Because, well, let's find out. So, 500 mile range. I climbed in this truck and it is cool. The driver's seat is in the center of the cab with an expansive view of the road. The cab itself is incredibly spacious compared to a standard big rig, and the specs are better than expected. Long range, unprecedented charging speeds, insane power, and a long warranty. In the world of trucking, the only thing that matters is the cost of doing business, and crucially, Musk didn't give the sticker price of this truck. But he said it'll cost at least 20% less to operate than a diesel. It does so in part by borrowing parts from Tesla's Model 3 sedan, including the motors, door handles, two touchscreens, and autopilot hardware. But this truck was not the biggest surprise that Tesla had in store, because the back of one of the semis opened up and this rolled out, an all-new Roadster sports car that no one was expecting. The $200,000 base model can go 0 to 60 miles per hour in 1.9 seconds, making it the quickest production car on Earth by a good margin. And it can go a stunning 620 miles on a single battery charge. The original Roadster helped define Tesla as a company, and this new version sets the bar for the future, with three motors, four seats, a convertible rooftop, and a massive 200 kilowatt hour battery pack. The, the point of doing this is to just give a hardcore smackdown to gasoline cars. It's hard to imagine how Tesla is going to bring all of this to production by 2020 as promised, even as it struggles with production on its new Model 3 sedan. However, the benchmarks that Tesla has laid down with the Semi and Roadster are so far beyond what anybody else is doing, it may very well push the entire transportation industry even faster toward going electric. Hmm. 
Here with us to discuss all the details from last night's unveiling, Loop Ventures co-founder Gene Munster joining us from Raleigh, North Carolina, but who was in L.A. at that unveiling last night, and Bloomberg Business Week's Max Chafkin in New York. So, Gene, I'll start with you. Elon knows how to put on a show, <laughs> but what do you think about the, the products behind it? How optimistic are you about this truck and the Roadster? Well, the truck's a big deal, and we can kind of back into what this potentially could add, setting aside any production issues that they're going to have with it, but kind of assuming they can produce it, this should add somewhere between 15 and 20 percent to the street numbers, probably in year 2023. And that's what investors do with a story like this. They look that far out. So this is a real market for them, and I think that uh, just given the orders we've already seen from like Walmart uh, this morning, I think that this, this truck is going to do very well. The Roadster, as your uh, package had, uh, had uh, indicated, was that uh, this is more about making a statement. Uh, I just would hate to be the Porsche engineers the day before the Wall Street Journal ran a story that they had come out with the fastest 911 uh, production car, zero to 60 in 2.8 seconds. Uh, that is well behind the 1.9 seconds for this Tesla Roadster. And so I'm just, I just marvel at the specs on this car, but it's not gonna move the needle financially for the company. Okay, it all looks good. It sounds good, Max. But, you know, the big question is, can he meet production goals for the Model 3 that has been a problem? Is all of this a distraction? Well, uh, it's, it, I think it's partly an intentional distraction. I mean, one of the things, and, and you just have to, you know, give your hats off to Elon Musk as, as a marketer, particularly an unconventional marketer. I mean, w anytime someone starts to, or, or a large group of people start to think, a Tesla sort of looks like a conventional car company, and, and maybe it's a conventional car company that isn't, you know, doing a particularly good job of it, Elon Musk comes out and in very dramatic fashion says, no, we are not that. We are thinking about the future in kind of these big new ways, you know, as as Gene said, growing our market, uh, you know, in a big way. Thing is, this stuff is, I think, far enough out that that and, and look, Elon Musk has a reputation for multitasking that I think the Tesla can sort of tell itself, you know, probably without lying to itself too much that much that it can, you know, focus on getting the cars out the door while it works on kind of the development of these new products. So so one thing that I think is important to Tesla and, and to Elon Musk is always having something that's, you know, three to four years out to keep people excited to keep people, you know, focusing on the future. Gene, do you think that investors and customers are going to start, you know, stop buying into these far off sales pitches? Not not at all. I mean, to Max's point is that what he's doing here is this is probably the more important part of the story last night was speaking to investors that they do have untapped opportunities and that this isn't about just electric vehicles, but it's about autonomy and renewable energy. I mean, these huge macro themes. If he can keep investors buying into this theme, which that's what last night was all about, if he can keep them doing that, he can keep tapping the equity and debt markets for more cash. Obviously, that that is uh, a pain point for the company, the ability to not uh, run out of cash. And so this is really uh, keeping those investors in the camp, in the group, in the club to continue to support his uh, goal of really accelerating the globe's adoption of renewable energy. Musk himself has admitted they are in production hell. How concerned are you, Gene, about them meeting their goals for the Model 3? Very concerned in the near term, and I, I would say the near term is the next six months. We expect another disappointment when they uh, release the next quarter, and I think that that doesn't really matter. I think what matters is what the production is a year and two years from now, and I guess I'm making the bet that they pulled it off with the production on these other cars. They'll do it here. I just want to make one other quick point about this production hell is that no other car manufacturer is built an electric car at scale. So all the other players are going to have to go through these same issues. And so this isn't something unique that Tesla's going through. Max, talk to us about the broader truck market. What's the competition there? Uh, what does the pricing of the Tesla Semi mean vis-a-vis -vis the other options on the market? Well, we don't know what the pricing of the, uh, the Tesla Semi is. What we, what we know is that he's, that Elon is saying that this will be 20%, uh, you know, th there'll be a two-year payback on, on, on buying this car, uh, that it'll be 20% more efficient than, you know, a comparable diesel car. The problem is we don't know what the assumptions are. And, and one caution here is that marketing a Semi truck is a lot different from marketing a car, particularly marketing a car to kind of early, the early adoption 
adopter set, the people who have bought Teslas so far. You know, part of the problem here, you know, gas prices are a big factor in terms of cost, but, but there are other things going on as well, like truck drivers need to be running these things all the time, and that's going to require a really good, really complete uh, ch charger network, and we don't really know that much about the plans there. We, he said some things about how quickly this is going to charge, but there are a lot of, uh, 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 basically a lot of unknowns here, and right now we're just sort of going off of, you know, a, a bunch of assumptions. It's kind of a black box. So the, the product looks very exciting. I think it's, it's pretty hard to say, you know, how popular this is going to be with truckers, and pretty much every other truck uh, company is working on this as well, although they don't appear to be quite as far along as Tesla is. So, Gene, a lot of this depends on how Tesla hits various mi milestones coming up. What are you going to be watching for over, let's say, the next year? If we can back up for, for just one minute, we actually took a stab in terms of what the cost of this is because they gave us a couple inputs and we were able to do some algebra. It's a guess, but I think it's probably going to get us close. Is that this, the cheaper truck is going to be about $225,000. The more expensive one will be about $275,000. That compares to a typical Class 8 diesel truck at about $150,000. And so uh, th that's just a, a little bit of context on uh, that. And I just totally forgot your question, Emily. I, I, you know what, Gene? We're going to have to leave it there. That, that was a great final thought. Uh, Gene Munsters of, of Loop Ventures and Bloomberg Business Week's very own Max Chafkin. Thank you both. Coming up, Spotify is trying to boost its appeal to artists. We'll tell you about the streaming service's latest acquisition next. This is Bloomberg. Spotify has acquired Soundtrap, a small maker of online music collaboration tools. This part of a broader effort by the world's largest music streaming service to increase its appeal to artists. Spotify says the startup is used by musicians, students, and general consumers to create, store, collaborate, and share files for producing music and podcasts. Spotify didn't disclose how much it paid for Soundtrap, which will continue to operate as a standalone service. Fast-growing food delivery startup Deliveroo says it's increased a current round of funding to $482 million. That is one of the largest rounds ever for a European startup, giving it deeper pockets to compete with rivals like Uber, Just Eat, and Amazon. Deliveroo said it raised an additional $98 million in funding on top of the $385 million announced in September. This values the London-based company at more than $2 billion. Investors back in the company include T. Rowe Price, Fidelity, and Index Ventures. And coming up, Apple misses the mark for one of its holiday flagship items. Why those waiting for its home speaker will have to wait a little bit longer. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Here's a check of first word news. The wife of Alabama Senate candidate Roy Moore said today her husband won't quit the race in the face of allegations he sexually assaulted young women years ago. Kayla Moore was joined in Montgomery by several dozen women at a rally supporting Judge Moore. So let me set the record straight. Even after all the attacks against me, against my family, against the foundation and now against my husband he will not step down meanwhile alabama governor Kay ivy says she plans to vote for more even though he faces those accusations of sexual misconduct ivy told reporters a factor in her decision is maintaining republican control of the u.s senate the florida democratic party chairman resigned friday after a report of anonymous allegations of sexually inappropriate behavior the decision came after four of his party's candidates for governor said he should step down the party posted on twitter a statement from stephen Tell, who had held the position since January. In Sweden, European Union leaders Friday signed a non-binding set of recommendations calling for better access to the job market, fair working conditions, and social protections. The social summit was the first such meeting in 20 years. It is time for us to put people first, because the European Union 
is nothing more, nothing less than our people. So addressing issues such as inequality, unemployment, unfair practices is not only morally right, it is the smart thing to do. Leaders also discussed Brexit on the sidelines of that meeting. Meantime, the European Council President Donald Tusk told reporters Friday the UK had not yet made sufficient concessions on financial settlements or on the issue of the Irish border. Speaking before that EU social summit, British Prime Minister Theresa May told reporters Brexit talks will stay on schedule. I was clear in my speech in Florence that we will honour our commitments. Um, but of course, we want to move forward together, uh, talking about the trade uh, issues and trade partnership for the future. I've set out a vision for that economic partnership. I, I look forward to the European Union responding positively to that so we can move forward together and ensure that we can get the best possible arrangements for the future that will be good for people in the United Kingdom and across the remaining EU27. However, Tusk later warned that several issues needed to be resolved by early December in order for negotiations to advance to trade. The two are scheduled to meet again next Friday. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. This is Bloomberg. More Bloomberg technology next. and this is Bloomberg Technology. It looks like Apple will be missing out on a hot new segment of the holiday market this year, smart speakers. The HomePod speaker is being delayed until next year. It was originally set to ship in December, now delayed until early 2018. This is the second major Apple audio device to miss its shipment debut in two years. Last year, Apple's AirPods shipped two months late. Joining me now here in the studio, Mark Gurman, who covers all things Apple for Bloomberg. So what happened? Yeah, I mean, it feels like the same story as, as last year. They need a little bit more time to get it right. Uh, according to them, the HomePod was supposed to be part of this array of holiday season gifts, smart speakers. I know a lot of people are buying them for each other for, you know, Hanukkah and Christmas. And, and they announced so, it back in June. They announced it back in June, which was a r very rare uh, time span between the announcement and the release for not a hugely significant new product. I mean, it's their most significant new hardware product in a while, but it's no iPad, it's no iPhone. So six months is a while. And why did they want to do that? Well, they wanted to really take the steam out of the Amazon Echo and Google Home. A lot of people wanted to buy those for the holiday season. A lot of people were also waiting to buy a HomePod now that they knew that was coming out. So do we have any more specifics about what isn't right yet? Right. I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into the HomePod. I mean, it's three things, right? It's like the hardware itself, it's the speakers, and as well as it's the software and the Siri and whatnot. Uh, we'll see what ends up happening, but obviously I feel like waiting and delaying a product is not as bad as releasing a product that is going to launch with a bunch of flaws. So I think they, they took their pick. They knew there was going to be serious problems with it. So they're waiting. What kind of impact do we think this will have on the quarter, which will already include, you know, three new iPhones? So that's good. <laughs> I would say zero. Uh, <laughs> no, really, because Apple has this other product segment, which is a very small percentage. It's sub 10% of the business, and the HomePod would only be a small percentage of that. And we did the math that even if the HomePod shipped in early December, it would still only have a few weeks of sales in the Q1. So I doubt their forecast included that for their revenue projection of uh, over $80 billion. So I don't think this is going to have a you know a fundamental impact in the quarter. So how will this position Apple vis-a-vis -vis the competitors which have gotten to market not just first but with a big head start. Yeah, I mean, the reason why they came out with the HomePod is because they really want to juice subscriptions to their services business and the Apple Music business. Someone wants a smart speaker before the HomePod comes out, what they're going to need to do is get a Google One, a Sonos One, or an Amazon One. If they buy one of those, it would expose them to those other companies' ecosystems, which could lose, the, can make Apple risk losing people to uh, services and other products from those companies that also make the smart speakers. And, you know, we mentioned the AirPod delays earlier, uh, but, you know, otherwise, what is the holiday season looking like? For Apple. For Apple, iPhones, iPhones and iPhones. The mm -hmm. iPhone 10 ships in two to three weeks now from their online store. So it's mid-November, you buy one, they'll get it before Christmas. There was a lot of fear that people wouldn't be able to buy one and get their hands on it for the late December time period. Uh, but it turns out Apple will have enough supply if you order one now. So I think that's going to be the strong seller of the season, along with the new iPads and Macs have been pretty popular too. All right, Bloomberg's Mark German, who covers Apple for us. Thanks so much for stopping by. Thanks. Now.
More of my conversation with Bill Gurley, Benchmark Capital General Partner. Benchmark is one of Uber's earliest and most vocal investors and played a big role in the dramatic ousting of former CEO Travis Kalanick. Gurley stepped off the Uber board earlier this year, and I spoke with him about the summer's unexpected turn of events and new leadership under CEO Dara Khosrowshahi. I left the board this summer and was replaced by my partner, Matt Kohler. And so I, I'm not present at the board meetings. I, I know that Matt is on that board and works with Travis. And I know through my own conversations with Dara that he's getting good advice and help from Travis. So when I look at the current situation, you know, I feel extremely happy relative to where we were, say, back in May or June. Um, I think the entire board, including Travis, is excited about Dara as CEO. I think he's doing an incredible Incredible job. I think he did a great job in, in interfacing with the regulatory bodies in London. He did it again in, in Brazil. Uh, we've just added Tony West, who Eric Holder helped us hire. And so I, I, I'm, I feel really good. I think we've probably reached a new level of stability, and I look forward to where, where we are going forward. Benchmark pushed for Travis's resignation and took it so far uh, so as to sue him. You know, that stunned a lot of people. Why did it come to that? Why, why couldn't you resolve that in private? Yeah, look, I, I think any venture capitalist, um, you know, hopes that they can use persuasion to to solve every problem that's out there so that stuff doesn't kind of roll out onto the field like it did in this case. Um, this summer, things that Uber had reached a place where, you know, we felt, along with, by the way, four, four other very large investors. So people typically say benchmark, but there was five investors, including Fidelity, um, who felt like all of the constituents at Uber were at risk um, if action didn't happen sooner. And so we did something unprecedented. Look, the, the number two, we get two questions quite frequently about this. One is, I can't believe you did this. And the other one is, why didn't you do this sooner? And there's no Venn overlap between those two things. And so we were in a place where we had to make a very hard decision. Um, we, you know, after much reflection, felt that we were on the right side of history. And at this point in time, I feel like we've got things to a place where there's a really good platform for success moving forward. And so um, while I wouldn't say that the past year has been something that we enjoyed as a firm or would look forward to doing again, I do think we made the right decisions. That was Bill Gurley, general partner at Benchmark. Coming up, Airbnb has been accused of discriminating against people with disabilities. Now the online rental service is taking steps to make sure that's a thing of the past. Next, this is Bloomberg. Amazon is expanding its plans to stream live sports. The online retailing giant announced an offering of 37 live tennis events to British and Irish video subscribers. Its U.S. customers will get access to the Association of Tennis Professionals streaming service, Tennis TV. Amazon is looking to set itself apart from streaming rivals like Netflix, which is with its live sports offerings. Earlier this year, it took over live streaming the NFL's Thursday night games from Twitter. Well, Airbnb is taking steps to remedy claims that its rental process is discriminatory. The company is now acquiring Accommable, a website that rents homes to travelers with physical disabilities. The move will give Airbnb access to a larger supply of houses and apartments with wheelchair ramps, elevators, and electric adjustable beds. Here you can see Accommable CEO Srin Matapali touring one such location. Accommable has about 1,100 vacation home listings spanning some 60 countries with information that is important to those with disabilities, such as door width and toilet seat height. Joining me now, Accommable CEO and founder Srin Matapali, who you see there in the video. Srin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank so you. tell us how you started Accommable and were able to grow this platform. Sure. So um, I used to be a corporate lawyer working in the city of London. And in 2012, um, I left that to go back to university again. Um, before that, I'd, I'd gone traveling for several months and I'd found it was really difficult. So I would turn up to places and rooms wouldn't be suitable for me, bathrooms wouldn't be big 
enough and it was just really difficult to find suitable travel locations. So fast forward a couple of years and I retrained as a web developer and I had a bit of time in the summer of 2015 and with a friend of mine from childhood, Martin, we basically prototyped a product uh, where you know we would vet listings with a huge amount of detail, have a far greater delete, uh, a far greater level of listing granularity, and allow our users to search for accessibility information. And it just started off as just a fun project to see whether we could help people. And from then on, people started engaging with it, and it grew from there. Now, your team is staying in London, but you're actually moving to Airbnb headquarters yes. here in San Francisco. How do you imagine Airbnb integrating Accommable into the site? Will it remain a separate site? Will all of your listings simply go on to Airbnb? Sure. So Accommable is going to be wound down over the coming months, and the idea is that we will be integrating our know-how and expertise into Airbnb. Um, our existing hosts are going to have the option of coming across, and we'll start that communication with them over the coming weeks. Now, you know, Airbnb has been criticized for discriminating against people with disability. Uh, there's a Rudkerd study that points this out, that people with disabilities get pre-approved at a lower rate than people without. The hotel industry has leveled the same kind of criticism. Why do you think Airbnb has had such a hard time dealing with these kinds of problems. So I mean it's difficult to comment on sort of past reports but I think the key issue here is that accessibility is not an Airbnb problem. I mean disabled customers are often disadvantaged in a whole host of different industries and it is why we built a Commonwealth because there was that opportunity there and I think the thing with Airbnb is that they are they're taking the lead here and really trying to solve this problem uh, by bringing us on board. So you know I think the key thing is to look ahead and look forward and actually the Airbnb BNB are being the thought leader here and actually trying to solve this problem. So what do you think are the root causes, you know, when it comes to hosts and getting people to remove their biases? Mm -hmm. So I think with us it's, it's less about the biases, there's a lot of issues to do with, you know, having the right listings and having the right amenities on there and actually, you know, how do you vet something? How do you know a roll-in shower is actually a roll-in shower? Mm -hmm. You know, are the grab rails correct? So this is the kind of expertise that we'll be bringing on board and helping train hosts and helping train the community in how to and in, in how to help the customers that we serve so you know what are some of the things that you personally plan to bring to the Airbnb table mm -hmm. obviously you've had a lot of conversations with them that's led you to this point yep so I'll be uh, you know it's my sort of second day at the company so I'll be putting <laughs> together the roadmap in due course and hopefully the community and the Airbnb community will help us build that so one of the things is it's working upon Airbnb's existing work where the filters have been improved there are new um, amenities that can be searched for on listings so it will be taking that forward and trying to build that and make it more useful to our community um, we are going to hopefully um, you know, work on increasing the user base of disabled hosts and really passionate about trying to get more disabled people to share their space on Airbnb and really building out the market because I think the World Health Organization said that 15% of the world's population have a disability of some kind. So we think this is an amazing opportunity here to reach an untapped market. And how well positioned do you think Airbnb is poised uh, to meet these needs versus hot the ho hotel industry in general? So independent rentals are really popular within our community. So if you are a disabled traveler, mm. you know, having extra space if you're traveling with family or assistance or if you have equipment to take, is actually really helpful. So Airbnb stock of independent rentals actually could help our community much more than anything else. All right. Well, good to have you on the show, Accommable CEO Srin Madapali, and congrats on the acquisition and welcome to San Francisco. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, WeWork has been pushing rapid growth in the last year with high profile real estate deals and partnerships. So, what is next? We will hear from co founder Miguel McKelvey. This is Bloomberg. is the third biggest startup by valuation in the U.S. after Uber and Airbnb and the largest in New York City. And it's recently been making headlines with its massive real estate deals like the historic Lord & Taylor location in New York City and a growing list of high-profile partnerships. In the latest series of Bloomberg at Cornell Tech, Scarlett Fu sat down with WeWork co-founder and chief creative officer Miguel McKelvey to discuss the company's plans to expand its mission.
these things have been evolving internally for a while. In some cases, in other cases, we're still a startup who changes and, and, and jumps on new ideas very quickly and executes on them. So uh, I think there's a mix of strategy and opportunism in everything we do, and the timing of certain things uh, happens. I mean, it's not like we weren't out in the market searching for uh, a building like the Lord and Taylor building, thinking that's what we have to get to, um, so we didn't, like the notoriety that came with it wasn't planned. And to be honest, it was a surprise to us because we didn't know that many people cared about that. But um, <laughs> I it, the New York Times wrote something about it. Well, yeah, I mean, it, to be honest, I mean, we do a lot of real estate deals, not acquisitions necessarily, but we're in a lot of buildings all over the world. So it's not, we didn't know, wow, this is some major <laughs> moment. But, um, but I think it was, that was a signal not only of what we did, but also the state of retail in the world and what's happening in the shift and all that. So. I think it was, it was newsworthy for multiple reasons. But the cool thing is it has been part, we've always given ourselves the room to explore and to think about different ways that we can um, fulfill this obligation that we have always felt to support people in a, multi, in a multi-dimensional way. And I don't know if you mentioned, mentioned RISE, but RISE is you know, a fitness and wellness concept that we launched as well. And so each one of these things, there's a signal toward a future that we believe in. So supporting people, not just in business success, but in health and wellness, in education, in you know, thinking, in cities, in communities. You know, we, we're, we, we've always been considering these things, but to be honest, it's hard to build a company like this, and the more and, and you need to hire people who are qualified to take on these challenges. And so, as we've been able to raise additional capital, as we've been able to hire more qualified people, you know, as our profile has grown, more people are attracted to us, more people with great talent and smart brains are coming to us, and that empowers us to move more quickly into these other into these other um, whatever ventures, divisions, whatever you want to call them. So the opportunity is there for you. You have the funding, you have the resources, but why now? Is this about striking while the iron is hot, when tech is doing really well, when the economy is doing really well? You know, I wish we were that like strategic and we had it all figured out for the timing and we knew exactly when to strike. I don't think it's like that. I think it's more, I mean, we did raise money, so there is an empowerment to having... Soft um, bank, for instance? Yeah, I mean, we raised an amount of money that gives us more flexibility, especially when you're doing acquisitions that include cash. It's a, it's a good thing to have cash as a component of those acquisitions. But additionally, I think um, a lot of it is people. Like we've learned that we have limitations as that, that people inside of the organization can only be asked to stretch so far. And it perhaps is just a confluence of people in the right time in the right place who can you know, grab hold of these objectives and then execute. And we're lucky to be able to support them. So if we've got someone who's entrepreneurial internally and has an idea, we now have the capability to support them you know, with, with a lot of different functions. Because one of the mistakes we made in the past was like, someone has a great idea, we're like, yeah, go ahead and do it. And then that person would like come back and say, okay, I need like help from the brand team, help from marketing team, help from sales, help from finance, help. And all those people would be like, whoa, who are you? Right, you know? <laughs> well, like, we have a We have a real job, Why, what are you asking us for? Like, we've never heard of this We Live before. Like, that's what, that was actually me. Like, I was sort of the intrapreneur who launched We Live. And I'm the co-founder of the company, and I was going around asking for resources, and people were like, sorry, I'm too busy for you. <laughs> so that, that's a change, is that, you know, you to, to, to build, um, to be able to, to take on these challenges, you have to first, you know, build um, teams that can be responsive. And, and, and you can only stretch teams so far. And we work and its extreme pace has stretched people very far. You stretch people really far. You're also stretching the concept of, of we in the community pretty far, including all these different offshoots that we just talked about. Um, when it comes to diversifying revenue, I wonder, are you recalibrating how much real estate will make up uh, your business versus other parts? Have you come up with a balance? Um, my title is Chief Culture Officer, and I specifically call it that, so I don't have to have anything to you do with money. You don't have to worry money. about that? <laughs> yeah. Um, before it was Chief Creative Officer, it's also specifically because I didn't want to have anything to do with money. But that said, um, again, I think what we've been, what we've been honest with our uh, investors in terms of what what we're trying to accomplish in the world. And I think that people have supported us because they believe in our ability to execute. Um, we've consistently executed and our, 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 our projects do well. And I think that's given us the license to explore. 
but you know, I'm not in the room when we present the numbers to uh, to the bankers or the investors. I just know that the result coming out is they give us the money, so <laughs> they must like that. They must like what they hear. That was WeWork co-founder Miguel McKelvey speaking with our own Scarlett Fu at the Bloomberg at Cornell Tech Series. And Bitcoin is testing another record, climbing to just short of $8,000 this week. The rally coming just days after it plunged as much as 29% and lost $38 billion in market cap. Several reasons have been cited for the volatility, including the fact that some investors are switching to alternative coins. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Of course, we're live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV. Weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. Happy Friday, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. This is Bloomberg.